So this is, but before I do that, I want to do a quick introduction. I want to pray, and I also want to open the floor to anybody who wants to share any testimony about the Brave journey. My, my word of introduction is we are in Brave. What's the Hebrew word for Brave? <laughs> Let's say it together. One, two, three. Hazak. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, this is our finale uh, on this series. We're going to be looking, as Liz said, at perseverance. And um, it's uh, just really exciting for me because uh, as we go from here, uh, that is, the, I believe, the dominant challenge uh, for all of us and the dominant challenge that Jesus and the apostles all warned us about. Uh, that we would have to persevere uh, in the faith. You might be wondering why I'm wearing this orange shirt. <laughs> I actually have three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that my awesome daughter, our baby, graduated from Wheaton last Sunday. And... Uh, I want to lift up the graduates. I want to lift up uh, all the high school, uh, high school. We have two in our youth group. Uh, all the high school graduates, all the college graduates, all the masters and PhD graduates. Uh, one of our families uh, graduated doc a doctorate in math. Uh, a guy named uh, Bill Robinson. He hasn't been around here for a while. He went off to college almost eight years ago, but he got his doctorate uh, last week or day before yesterday, I think. Um, it takes a lot of perseverance. I know in my daughter's life, it took a lot of perseverance uh, to overcome obstacles, barriers, whether they're medical, relational, emotional, academic, all kinds, and it takes a lot. So I want to wear this in honor of all those graduates that are getting it done. Um, also, I uh, learned last week that because the 21 Egyptian believers who were executed by ISIS were clothed in orange, there are a lot of people in the church worldwide wearing orange to worship. And I just pray, and I'm, I'm so grateful for Paul's attention to wake us up as to why we're here and how important our worship is, that our worship would never trivialize the people, starting with Jesus, who died. Who died for their faith, for their convictions for uh, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So, uh, and you didn't do that this morning. You did not trivialize that. The worship, I felt, was from the heart. So, I bless you in that. And uh, the third reason is, is that um, we've had a family persevering here um, through incredible obstacles um, to uh, finally close on a house a few days ago in our neighborhood. The Rasmussens, who have lived 20 or 30 minutes away in Milford are now living down the road off of Plainville on, yeah, on, uh, on Britain. And it, it's nothing more than a miracle how God orchestrated all that. And so I'm wearing clothing in which I can help him move later today. And I want to encourage all of you um, who are able to give an hour or even a little bit less, uh, whatever, whatever you can give today to help move. Uh, talk to Raz after service and he'll tell you how to help. So uh, let me pray for our time. Father, um, as we open up the word of God now and study uh, the end of the life of Peter, would you just open our hearts to your message? Father, as people uh, share testimonies like Liz did of what you've done, uh, so far in the brave journey, I ask that you would use that for your glory. And Father, I pray that you would pour out on us uh, the gift of perseverance, um, Father, which comes from you, that you would do that. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so anybody want to share a testimony? I've got time for two or three of what God's doing. Where? Somebody pointed. Ah, okay. Rob. All right, this is spontaneous. Um, it's been on my mind for a while, and uh, the Brave Journey has been a phenomenal, uh, as we all know, journey of uh, really just mirroring the life of Peter as he goes through all of those uh, doubts he's had, all of the uh, problems he's had, really kind of uh, facing the fears in his life. And um, part of our journey, our family is considering. Um, my wife and I especially, a, a large career move for me, so which would really kind of take me out of my 
uh, it's been my comfort zone since gosh, probably the last 20 years. And uh, really considering uh, something where I can take my same skill set that I have, but apply it in a, in a completely different, um, a different uh, vocation. So it's a, it's a big step, and we've been praying through this a lot. And uh, it, the timing is, God's amazing, right? He puts all this stuff together. I don't know how he can possibly do this, but he's God, right? So, um, but all of these things, this brave journey, and how it's affecting everybody, and even in our life, it's just the timing of it, and the timing of things going on in our life with the timing of this brave journey. I'm just amazed. I'm just blown away at that the uh, the divine providence there, how he can just line things up like he does. Uh, no, no, just constantly amazed and just very thankful for the group that we have, a small brave group, and uh, just we're going through this journey together, and it's been fantastic, and it's just opened doors and opened our hearts and our our eyes as well. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Awesome. Anybody else? Okay, Brock. So I'm part of a group of guys who uh, get together, and uh, it's kind of one of those things where you don't have too many just groups of just men who get together and read the Bible and study it. And so uh, this Brave Journey has been really neat because uh, the group of guys that we have is just four other guys. Uh, we've been meeting weekly. And the conversations have just been really good. Um, it's something that uh, I felt that the Lord has just put in my heart to just meet with men and uh, open up the Bible and just talk about what's going on in our lives and how the Lord's speaking to us. And so I guess my encouragement that I've been getting from the Lord is just the fact that if uh, you get together with, uh, for, for us, a group of guys and really just... Uh, dive into what the Lord's talking to you about, um, he'll speak to you, and uh, we've just seen some really good uh, conversations and some good fruit from it. Excellent. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Andrew? Yeah, I'm, I'm eating the uh, boy my sister gave up for adoption, and the uh, Somerville, South Carolina, uh, next weekend. Um, uh, there's a, there's an odds between my sister and I on it. Um, uh, I've been ousted by the family because of it. So it's really been um, trying to keep the peace with her and um, with the family and uh, do this, which I think is right, has uh, really been a journey and an un unpredictability. Um, so... Um, I just ask your prayers for next weekend, and I don't know what to expect. I'm just stepping out on a limb, and uh, hope things will go good. All right. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Let's just pray about that. Uh, Father, um, I just lift up these uh, testimonies. I thank you for um, all that you're doing uh, in Rob's life and in his brave group. I thank you for the men's group that Brock testified about that you just continue to build them up in the faith and encourage each other. And we lift up An Andrew who's um, attempting to uh, show his uh, nephew that he's never met um, that he is um, trying to bring him God's love. Would you just help him do that and help him do it in a way which is uh, honoring to you? And Lord, whatever um, consequences or fear he may have about that, would you take that away? Give him uh, courage. Give him the hazak of the kingdom of God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're in the final Sunday on the brave journey. And as I mentioned, we're looking at the theme of perseverance. We're going to look at the end of Peter's life. And we've been looking at Peter all the way through. Uh, Peter's this guy with these huge highs and lows. We've looked at a number of stories in the scriptures. I'm going to mention a couple of more this morning. Um, but we, I want to talk about this great quality of perseverance. You know, we really value it. If you look at the movies that do well, if you look at the sporting programs that do well, we love a hero who perseveres. I can think of the movies like Rocky or Rudy. And uh, we just love those movies because someone stuck it out. Um, and when a relationship uh, is not going well and... Uh, a romance movie where 
husband and wife work it out or um, the, the love gets expressed in healthy ways. We, we love when people persevere. We love watching stories like that. We love civil rights activists who persevered. Um, I think of uh, all the stories about William Wilberforce and the, uh, the wiping out of slavery in uh, England in the 1800s. I think of so many different stories of leaders like Churchill or like Mandela who took a stand and persevered through thick and thin for it. And so whenever we come into a situation where we're in a place where we are not... Um, meeting the goals we've set. We are still struggling with alcohol. We are still struggling with pornography. We are still struggling with fear. Or we're struggling with relationships that just somehow cannot seem to be repaired. We're struggling with um, in a marriage. And we're just, we're just finding we've hit the wall. And we're really, we're really uh, finding it difficult. Friendships that seem to be broken or again hitting the wall. I think of so many different situations where you just want to quit. And I, I wouldn't be honest with you guys if I didn't say that there were times, dozens of times, in the ten and a half years I've been serving here where I've wanted to quit. Dozens of times. But wanting to quit and having the thought of quitting cross your mind versus quitting are two very different things. Two very different things. And I think about the, the, the things we've started and that we haven't finished. And the Bible tells us over and over again the life of Jesus tells us over and over again, and as we're going to see today, the life of Peter tells us over and over again, that it isn't how you start that counts. It's how you finish that counts. God rewards those who finish. Jesus said uh, in Matthew 24, only those who stand firm until the end will be saved. And so whether it's our spiritual journey, our relational journey, our emotional journey, some of us, like myself, have been struggling with weight and food our whole life. And there comes a time when God just presses in and says, you know what, I am your sustenance. Or we're struggling with finances. Or we're struggling with having the right job. There's so many different layers of the spiritual life that encompass physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual parts of our journey. And we need to be shown how to persevere. And Jesus is saying, this is, this is the way. Walk in it. Now, Peter had an incredibly crazy life. And he needed to persevere. Now, let me just give you a definition of perseverance. All right? Perseverance is, on one level, very simple. Finishing till the end. But if you look at the Greek word that translates that, there's, there's two primary words that we see in Scripture. The first word is hupomeno. That literally means abide under. Hupo means under. Meno means abide. So when we started way back in the commands of Christ in John chapter 15, and he says, abide in me, what he's saying is the key to perseverance is to abide in him. So another way to think about it is abide in Jesus under the weight of whatever it is is weighing on you right now. Don't do it on your own. Don't do it in willpower. But abide in Christ under whatever that weight is. Endure patiently. Sometimes it's translated. Another time it's just translated patience. Perseverance is, that word is literally translated patience. And there's another word that is often used and it literally means long, and, and in some of the English translations it's translated long-suffering. And what it literally is, is the word for long 
and the word for wrath or explosion put together. In other words, sometimes God lives this very attribute out by not exploding in wrath at us, but actually waiting. Waiting for us to come around. I think the return of Jesus is going to be timed in such a way that everyone gets the maximum opportunity to turn to God. And then one day the wrath will be released. But right now, it's a long time until the wrath of God. That's another word for patience. But it also can be used for us. And that is to go a long time without quitting, without exploding, without tearing someone's head off, but to wait and be patient. So patience, long-suffering, perseverance, these are all the same semantic idea. It's all the same thought that we can continue. And it, it is anchored in this idea of abiding, of enduring and patiently uh, waiting uh, for God to give us what we need. Now, I mentioned earlier, Peter's life is just up and down crazy. Let's look at Peter's brave timeline, all right? And we've looked at this, some of this stuff already, but in about A.D. 27, Peter met Jesus. And uh, we, did, we saw in Luke chapter 5 the miracle of the fish and the, the nets full of fish when they had caught no fish all night. And Peter has passionate early faith. And then we see in the next year or so, he's just overestimating himself a lot. As I'm the leader, and I'm going to do this, and you're, you're the Christ, and there's no way you're going to suffer. And Jesus has to literally say to Peter, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You can't protect me from what God wants to do with me. By the way, that's a good lesson for all of us to learn. None of us can protect other people from what God wants to do. And none of us can deal with the consequences to other people of our obedience to God. We cannot manage those things. Peter had to learn that. Then in AD 29 and 30, we see Peter growing in his fear of men, growing uh, to the point where on the night before he was crucified, due to his fear of man, Peter would deny Jesus three times after saying that he would never do that. And in A.D. 30, after the resurrection, we see, we studied in John chapter 21, the restoration of Peter by Jesus. So for each denial, Peter is asked by Jesus, do you love me? Once, twice, three times. And Peter is reinstated in a painful way. Jesus painfully confronted him with his three denials. And, and Peter, Peter then... Uh, had to tell him three times. God's grace let him overcome that. And even at the restoration of Jesus, literally the next chapter, Peter is comparing himself to John and saying, like, how long is he going to live? How long am I going to live? And John, Peter literally is told by Jesus, don't you worry about John. And you're going to die in the way I tell you to die. And you're going to be doing things you don't want to do for my sake. And by the way, lest we think John is a hero, remember him and James already came to Jesus, even with their mother, asking for the seat on the right and the seat on the left. And they thought they should somehow get treated in a different way than everybody else. So Peter comes to this point and he receives the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost Sunday, he stands up and he explains to everybody what's going on, preaches the sermon of all sermons, and has 20 years of powerful ministry. Then in A.D. 50, or thereabout, Peter gets rebuked publicly by Paul for being a wimp. We'll look at that in a second. Then in uh, the next 11 years, Peter goes on, and we assume learns more about following Christ. And then in A.D. 61, he writes his first letter. And in that first letter, we learn that Peter has somehow been transformed uh, by God, and he writes about that. We're going to cover that this morning. And then two years later, in A.D. 63, Peter writes his perseverance plan. He writes the second letter. 
to which he gives us the secret of perseverance, which we're going to look at today. And then finally, a couple of years after that, according to extra-biblical church documents and tradition, Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't count himself worthy to be crucified right side up. Crucified upside down. Um, and we can see that Peter finished strong. Peter was given by Jesus the grace and the perseverance to finish strong. And he's going to tell us exactly how to do that today. So that is the life of Peter. That is the, 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 the journey he had. And let's look at that scene in A.D. 50 when he had to be rebuked by Paul. It's in Galatians chapter 2. Verses 11 to 13, again, written by Paul about A.D. 50, 49 to 51, somewhere in there. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in the, his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. In other words, Peter had been told by Jesus in the vision of the food and of going to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, we studied last week. He'd been told that it was cool to be with the Gentiles, that he had the freedom now in the new covenant to do that, and he had the freedom to eat with them. And so he started doing that in Antioch. And then when the Jewish people came around, he withdrew. So people like us who were his friends and were having meals with him, all of a sudden, you know, he would invite, you would invite him over for dinner and he wouldn't come. And then you'd find out that he was hanging out with the Jews. And so he was, he was living as a free person in the new covenant. And then he became afraid of the Jewish legalistic people and he even led other people astray and they were all astray and Paul came in and saw the situation himself being a, a, a God honoring Jew and said this is nuts you have, you have, you have you've got fear of man Peter I'm going to rebuke you publicly that's sinful you, you cannot do that we are to eat together we are one in Christ Jew and Gentile now what's really neat is that Peter had community Peter had others, Barnabas, and it says a bunch of others. We read about the church in Antioch. There was community and accountability. And we'll see later that Peter and Paul were reconciled. And they both knew that they were on a very important mission from God together. So they got that straightened out. But what is Peter's storm? Well, we've seen him sinking in the water. We've seen him denying Christ. We've seen him uh, having to be rebuked by Paul and his storm or his signature sin was fear of man he was afraid of what other people thought and that governed his activity you know fear of man is a very common thing it's the thing that prevents us from sharing the gospel boldly with people we work with or with neighbors we're afraid of what they'll think we're afraid of being rejected we're afraid of losing a friendship we're afraid of people we're afraid of people. I've got it. Anybody else have it? I have fear of men. God wants to deal with that in our lives. My brave heading was to abide in Jesus and proclaim him boldly to my neighbors. That was my brave heading. And that is my heading now. And this is what I'm pursuing. What I'm asking God to give me the relational openings and opportunities to be fearless in proclaiming the resurrection and the good news of the resurrection. Well, Peter learned from, from this and uh, from other things. And uh, in A.D. 61, he wrote 1 Peter. And uh, I've just got a selection here in chapter 4, verses 10 and then 12 to 14. And Peter uh, says this, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. That's believers and non-believers, others, administering God's grace. One way to administer God's grace is to share the word of grace. 
That, that there was a resurrection. That there is forgiveness for sins. That there is a future that people can have apart from this world. And then he goes on, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And I believe this promise, this joy and this spirit of glory and of God resting on us is the reward. This is what it means to abide. It means to rest in the spirit and the glory of God on you. Our sins confessed, our hearts open to God, receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit and abiding with Him as we go. It's not just in our quiet time. It's all day, all day, filled with the Spirit, walking with God, blessing others, filled with the joy and the glory of God. You know, if you've ever walked in and started talking about your faith and someone says to you, well, my uncle was a Methodist or my great uncle was a priest, or what's happening there is that the grace of God, the presence of God is with you and it causes people to make religious comments that somehow signify, yeah, I'm like you, I'm kind of spiritual too, I have a relative who's spiritual, or I used to do this or that. These comments come out of nowhere. Why? Because the presence of God is with us. And similarly, the rejection we may feel comes because the presence of God is with us. And Peter's saying, expect it. It's the way it is. It's part of the program. So what is Peter's antidote to fear of man? Well, according to this letter, it's serving and suffering. It's serving and suffering. This is why Liz brought up the idea that serving sometimes is the best way to step out of ourselves and to learn to walk like Jesus. And suffering. And suffering. It's part, it's part of the journey. And it shouldn't surprise us. And we shouldn't be worried about our comfort and some of the other things that we think about in that time. But we should look with joy. Because Jesus looked with joy for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He knew there was joy on the other side. And Peter is also saying this, serving and suffering and there's joy and there's the presence of God on us. And then he goes on and we come to some of his last words. And now we see an incredible thing. We see his advice to us based on 30 plus years, almost 40 years of following Jesus. And here's what he says in the second letter, 2 Peter, written about A.D. 63. And he says this, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm just going to break it up in chunks, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, the promises of God, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. One translation says you may partake in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires, which is really a more general translation of the word, which is lust. Lust. Wanting what we want when we want it, even if it doesn't belong to us. Lust. And so Peter is saying, look, you can partake the promise is you can partake in the divine nature itself. And of course, he's referring to the life of God in us. Now, let's continue. He's not done yet. Verses 5 to 7. For this very reason, because God has done this for us, for that reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, 
to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. This is Peter's plan for perseverance. Just to unpack that a little bit, uh, these are, in a, in a sense, a reminder of the gospel and the fruit of the Spirit in one. Because it starts with faith. Everything starts with faith. If we believe Christ died for our sins and raised, was raised from the dead, if we believe and trust in that, that's the beginning of a relationship with God. Until you've asked God to forgive your sins and you've trusted the blood of Christ to pay for your sins, you cannot have a relationship with God. That's the beginning. It always starts with faith. But then he tells us to go on. That there is some effort. Make every effort. There is effort. You can't earn your way to salvation. Only God can do that for you. But there is a great effort involved in disciplining our lives to conform into all that the scriptures have for us and all God has for us. So there's a recipe here. I'm going to come back to that. Let's continue the passage. Verses 8 and 9. For if you possess these qualities, this, these eight qualities he just mentioned, if you possess them in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. So there is a real warning here. And there's a test. The test is if you have these, these qualities in increasing measure, that's very similar to Paul in Galatians 5 who's giving us the fruit of the Spirit and saying, look, against these things there's no law. What Paul is saying, Peter is saying the same thing. He's saying if you have these qualities in your life in increasing measure, then um, that is the test that you actually do know God, you are walking with God and things uh, of God. And if you don't, then you've forgotten what the entire thing's all about. And that puts you in a very bad place. Then he finishes. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. You will never fall. You will persevere. You will finish till the end. You will gain your reward in the eternal kingdom. You will prove yourself to be a follower of Jesus. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is Peter's perseverance plan. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, tells us where does the perseverance come from? It is the perseverance of Christ. He does it for us. He does it for us. So Peter's perseverance plan at the end of his life wraps up his experience with Jesus, his experience with the Father, his experience with the Holy Spirit. And it's his last words, the words of a man who's near the end of his life, who's made a ton of mistakes, who's seen miracles, who's walked on water, who's denied his Savior, who's performed every religious malfunction you could ever imagine, who's committed every sin you can imagine, who's the loser of all losers, who is redeemed, forgiven by the grace of God. He is speaking to us now. And his perseverance plan, I've got it here on a little, on a little equation. Um, Faith, that's always the starting point. Add goodness. Add knowledge. You've got to grow in the knowledge of God. You've got to grow in learning to express God's goodness to others. You've got to grow in self-control. Say no to the flesh. Say no to your lustful desires. Then you've got to grow in perseverance. That's where you abide in Jesus under the weight of whatever's bothering you at that time. Godliness, brotherly kindness, that's phili philia, that's the brotherly love. And love, that's the godly love, that's agape. 
And the equation in Peter's perseverance plan is that faith plus these things equals perseverance. Calling an election made sure. Never falling. There's warnings all over scripture about falling away. And people who walk away from God. People who fall away. Paul had seven or eight guys in his letters that he said, so-and-so's gone, and so-and-so's deserted me, and these guys are turned to the darkness, and whatever. And all these guys that were on Paul's team are walking away. And Peter says, look, keep your eye on Jesus. Keep receiving from him. Keep persevering. And what is this? This is essentially the Spirit-filled life. What this is, is having the Spirit of God living in you. And these qualities will be produced by the Spirit. In another way of thinking about it, 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 1 is Peter's list of the fruit of the Spirit. And he's simply saying to us, look, get filled by God's Spirit. This is God's plan for every situation. Let Him live in you and through you. You don't live anymore. If you're a follower of Jesus, in some way that I cannot explain to you, you were crucified with Christ. You were on the cross with Him. And it's not you who lives anymore, it's Him who lives in you. That's why we say, love in Jesus and live in Jesus. Because it's only by His power and by His Spirit that we can cross the finish line. As the worship team comes up, we're going to have a time of ministry here at the end where you can get prayer and we're going to sing a song together. But I want to finish 2 Peter. Uh, it's a great finish. And I encourage you to read 1 Peter and 2 Peter. They're short letters if you haven't done that during this journey. In chapter 3, the very last words of Peter... He says, uh, in starting in verse 11, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, that is, fire that destroys everything before the new heaven and the new earth. It says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And here's Peter's, Peter's final words to us. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, that is, with God. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Now Peter and Paul are reconciled by now. Now Peter's getting a little jab in because Paul was educated and Peter wasn't. But they both know they're writing scripture. So he writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. In other words, his message and my message are the same. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. I promise you, if you want to find distortion of Paul's letters, go on the internet and see what they say about this and what Paul really said about that and what Paul really said about that. That's what goes on here. And Peter's warning us of that as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In other words, Paul and Peter knew they were writing scripture. They knew that they had met the risen Jesus Christ and they knew their words were true and were scripture. Therefore, finally, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
Every single character in the scriptures is worthy of study because we see their journey with God. We see how God transformed them. We see it with Peter in this journey called Brave.